I, I, there has been a big increase in imports in the last five years of, of what, what you would call consumer foods or processed foods. That has been driven by two things, one being the devaluation of sterling. Uh, so for the first seven years that sterling that we set up the euro, if you like, we had an exchange rate of about 68 pence sterling. We're now up around 85, which means that UK produced consumer foods are much cheaper than they used to be. That combined with supermarket uh, buying decisions to source more product uh, in, in the UK has led to a situation where we now have up to 70% of our consumer foods is imported. Now, to say that it's just an economic competitiveness uh, argument is wrong because the big issue has been that as supermarkets have gone through this particular recession, they've pushed all the risk back to the supply chain. And the supply chain here is not able to respond. It's not big enough. So a lot of the business has gone to the multinational businesses in the UK. So again, if you're looking at the vulnerability we have to that, it's not a, a clever place to be to have 70% of your consumer foods uh, being imported. We need to start having a, a mature conversation with retailers about long-term arrangements where business risk is shared. It has to be done because you cannot have a situation where the supply chain carries all the risk. What will happen is that the supply chain will disappear. That's the facts of it. And I think there's been you know, cuckoo economics applied to supply chains uh, that, that don't take into account that a food supply chain, if it isn't sustained, just disappears and therefore you starve. I mean, it's one thing for Apple, for instance, to be manufacturing parts of an iPhone in Ireland and suddenly we get higher cost and they manufacture that part in Taiwan. You still get an iPhone. If, at the same time, a dominant retailer creates a situation where a fruit and vegetable supplier or a liquid milk supplier cannot make a return in Ireland. They don't produce the product and consumers don't get to eat it. So, What you're talking about is farmers and processors being the supply chain. And if you have a situation, as was very uh, well illustrated in 2009, in the mid midst of, of a huge recession, farmers got very low prices, processors made zero or minus uh, rates of return, and the retailer, uh, if you like, rode out the recession. Re supermarkets did not have a recession. That's not sustainable. The farmers, uh, if, if over a period of time they don't get a return, they stop farming. The processors go bust, and then there is no food supplied. So it's, it's pretty fundamental and in lots of ways it seems terribly obvious but there was a notion that suggested that again go back to some of the points I made earlier that really if the supply chain is being squeezed you just move supply to another area that's not possible with food uh, okay there are certain elements of food that will always come from exotic places but the reality is if you're lo looking at things like liquid milk uh, and meat products and fruit and veg you must have a local supply chain because as you say if you get uh, a major climate event or a war or an earthquake and we suddenly had to feed ourselves we would have a big problem we would probably only have about two weeks supply of consumer foods in this country I think there's a, there is a huge opportunity uh, for local communities to build small cooperatives because one of the myths of uh, growth in retail dominance was that because they were larger scale they were delivering food at lower pr prices to consumers. That hasn't been the case. If you look in depth at what's happened, what has really happened is that retail margin has increased for the dominant buyers. So it's not that they are buying cheap and passing it back to consumers in terms of lower food prices. They haven't done that. They have made bigger margins in their own businesses. If you go back to 2009 and the depths of recession, farmers lost money, processors lost money, and retailers maintained their margin, particularly in food production. So that model needs to change. Uh, and in doing that, I think one of the concerns of some of the policy makers has been, well, if we do more local uh, and you give mo local opportunities, will consumers pay more? Not necessarily. It can all be done in a situation where everybody in the chain makes a relevant and, if you like, a normal margin. But you can't have a situation where the only person in the chain making any margin at all is the supermarket. That leads to the killing off the supply chain, which is what we've had for the last four or five years. And what's the The reality is that if you take a, a sort of fresh food product, 99% of all the value add and production costs takes place between the farmer and the processor.
and yet they would get less than half of the, the final retail price on the product. So the retailer adds a shelf, just makes the shelf available and he gets at least 50% of all the money made on the product. So it's, it's totally out of sync in terms of investment in production, in terms of processing costs and in terms of business risk. Well, there's huge opportunities in local food production because what you have is a situation where a farmer produces an agricultural product or, or a food output and sells it to a local retailer. The farmer in his production buys his inputs locally. So he's buying his, uh, he's injecting money into his part of the local economy. So you get both about integration, if you like, from the point of view that your food is, that you buy in your supermarket is bought locally, but also that that business, the farmer's business, is buying its inputs locally. So it's the biggest and strongest way of injecting money into the local economy that we have.